Our guest in this segment is Delegate Clay Riley out of the 72nd. That's Harrison County. Clay, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning, Rob. Good morning, Bill. Good morning, Maria. Clay? How are you guys today? Great, thank great. you. Clay, thumbs up on the dog in the mural or thumbs down? <laughs> <laughs> An often debated uh, discuss, uh, discussion there. So, yeah, I can see where that, uh, both sides of that. Story, of that <laughs> Good answer, Clay. Good answer. Truly taken the middle of the road. Indeed. Yeah. Art, yes. Artfully played, Clay. Artfully <laughs> played. Uh, Clay is the vice chair in the Committee on Fire Departments and Emergency Medical Services, serves on banking and insurance, finance, house rules, technology, and infrastructure as well. And uh, this isn't the specific reason why we have you on today, Clay, but while I do have you, in regards to your membership on the Finance Committee, the revenue numbers for the year came in strong, triggering, as uh, we understand, at least some form of a tax cut. Uh, the governor has said he'd like to call you folks in to make it a full 10%. Uh, any thoughts on the fiscal year first before we get started on other things and the potential tax cut, Clay? Yeah, I think what you've seen over the past number of years is it's good fiscal discipline and policies that have been put into place, you know, since 2015 have led to this surplus. And I think we have spent it on one-time investments, such as additional road infrastructure, water, sewer. And I think what you've seen is that by being disciplined, we've been able to provide 21 and a quarter percent tax cut previously. And when we did that, we put it into place so that we had a very measured approach to continuing to give money back to the citizens of West Virginia. And that's what you see by this trigger on this tax cut. I think that when you look forward, we're always encouraged to give money back to the people of West Virginia. I think you also have to look at what future liabilities are coming down the road. Um, I think you heard some announcements of the opening of the Hope Scholarship. You just have to look and see where all those numbers are going to play out over the long term. So while I've begun to look at it, I've not made a decision on exactly where that is. I'm always in favor of giving money back to the citizens of the state of West Virginia. But, it, you know, being on finance, you have to look at what the long term horizon is. We had uh, the treasurer on Riley Moore yesterday, also Delegate Pat McGinn, and we talked about some of those future obligations. And you are correct. Tax cuts are great, but not if the next year you end up running a budget deficit and have to go back in and find another way to make up missed uh, revenue. One of the issues I have, Clay, with that is that there is a lot of discussion. I'm sure Eric Household will address this later. A lot of discussion on what is the best approach. And a, a procedure that shows a lot of discipline was introduced in past, and that is the uh, trigger mechanism. So what I'm hearing from the governor now is kind of disregarding the, the discipline uh, for near-term benefits, putting it long-term at risk. So the question is, what happened to the discipline? Well, I think you always look at what the discipline is, and, and you have – projected obligations that are out there and then you know sometimes revenues even exceed those projected obligations and so while you can take a measured approach that doesn't mean that if you have an opportunistic or an opportunity that comes about that says hey we're exceeding what we are disciplined projected amount that we might be able to do a little bit of more. So I think you got to look at what your long-term liabilities are. Are you really exceeding where you expected to be and, and maintain a course so it's not necessarily uh, throwing discipline out the window, what it is is maintaining the discipline and looking to make sure that you're ahead of where you're scheduled to be and you have the ability to do it without sacrificing your obligations. Is that what the triggers were supposed to do? Yeah, well, the triggers were put in there into place to make sure that you maintain with uh, inflation. And so sometimes you may grow uh, in, ex in excess of inflation. And while you'll be able to take those off, that doesn't mean necessarily that there may be other savings that you're anticipating that haven't factored in. So, yeah, the triggers were put in there specifically to maintain a progression towards zero. But, you know, there was always the possibility that the legislature could come back in and say, yeah, we think we could do just a little bit more for these reasons. So I think it's always a good discussion. Uh, I like the discipline and trigger mechanism. I supported that and, and worked with the majority leader householder on that who led that effort. And I was happy to do so. And, but I also think that it was always discussed back then that if there was ever an opportunity that we thought we were exceeding where we were anticipating to be, that we could look at what those 
you know, what it might potentially be if there was any additional that we could sustain. And speaking of leader Householder, he will follow Governor Justice this morning in the nine o'clock hour. Clay, let's talk about the Chevron decision from the Supreme Court and how you see it playing out in West Virginia, which is a mineral rich state. Yeah, the Chevron uh, decision was uh, really significant. I think you saw some indications that hopefully, at least I saw some indications that I thought when Attorney General Morrissey won EPA versus West Virginia uh, a few years back that they began to look at the, um, you know, curtailing the agency's uh, overreach on some on certain areas. Uh, the Chevron deference case, how it specifically, I think, will impact West Virginia is primarily through some of the flow down uh, clauses from the feds to the state. You know, a lot of times what we hear when we're looking at policies as well, we need to align uh, with the federal policies here. Specifically, you know, everybody, it's a pretty obvious that this impacts EPA and, and obviously West Virginia DEP. And the DEP has primacy. So a lot of times what you'll hear is, well, if we don't follow up with what this, what this proposal is, then we may lose primacy. And you don't want to go back to EPA having, you know, the prime primacy for uh, regulations uh, in the state of West Virginia. You want that to stay within DEP. So I think you're going to begin to see those agencies um, not have as, as big a swath to, uh, to propose rules. You know, with the Chevron case, agencies had to be reasonable. Well, with this overturning of that, they no longer just only have to be reasonable, they have to be right. Now, Congress can still delegate authority to those agencies, but it just needs to be explicitly stated. As it rolls into the state of West Virginia, one of the things that we have, I think, with, which is one of the few states, is the Legislative Rulemaking Review Committee. I think this case puts more pressure on the rulemaking review process to make sure that we get it right um, than, it, than it did previously. So that's where I see the major uh, impl- impl- implica- uh, implications. I'm sorry, let's get tongue tied there. Um, that and then on the energy sector as well, because you've seen, you know, from the EPA power plant rules, whether it's the ESG policies, you know, those are all impacting investments into oil and gas projects, which is about, you know, impact West Virginia. So I think those are the primary areas you're going to see the impact uh, to the state. So, Clay, would you say then that the the two that you just made reference to, EPA, DEP, are they big offenders um, currently? Or how, what's your take on that? Well, it's not that they're big offenders, so I don't I don't want to paint them with a, a a negative brush there. But I think what it does is it makes them be more specific on the regulations that they are trying to implement. So, for example, in the Clean Water Act, Congress gave specific authority to EPA to set water regulations and effluent quality standards. So when those come down to the state, they're very specific. Now, EPA may recommend that they adopt certain policies, but DEP ultimately is the one who proposes those policies, and those get approved by by the legislature. Uh, there's currently a, a, a case pending where um, EPA is, is being sued by an environmental agency or environmental group to force West Virginia to comply with some additional water quality standards that the legislature hasn't approved yet. So where, where I mentioned those two specifically, Maria, is because EPA does not have the prime role in setting those regulations. Those come through DEP, but they try to push them to the EPA will try to push them to the point of complying with whatever those policies may be, even though they're not explicitly uh, authorized by Congress or approved by the West Virginia legislature. Clay, there's two words or two things that gets people's uh, anger up. One is taxation. The other is regulation. Uh, You used the term a while ago, regulation should be reasonable and right. Uh, Both of those are very subjective, especially right is very subjective. What's right in one guy's eyes may not be in the other person's eyes. Uh, Are we, with the Chevron, are we trading a, a scientific-based decision to what's a an economic or an emotional-based decision? 
Well, I think that's a good question, Bill. I mean, it's a very legitimate question. I think where the the, de- the difference that comes in in my mind is Congress can still use scientific based solutions by giving specific scope of authority to those agencies. So when they say EPA, you shall set Clean Water Act water quality effluent standards, that gives them the specific authority to do that. When you go to say, let's say the ERISA uh, agency and the implementation of ESG based um, financing and, and disclosure, that authority was never specifically given to ERISA that they, you know, can look at how companies are impacting ESG in their their returns. So it's not that they are completely getting away from it. Now it's going to have to change how Congress writes statutory, you know, statutes. But it doesn't mean that they have to walk away from a scientific base. It's just they have to be clear in their scope of authority. And it's going to take a while, I think, to reconcile with existing code because it's not been that way. Um, But that still doesn't mean that they can't go through the federal rulemaking process. And I think what you'll see is you'll see more clarity on what the rulemaking process will be coming out of Congress. And I think the scope of authority of what they can write those rules. And I think you'll see more emphasis on that rulemaking process than than necessarily you saw before. Delegate Clay Riley, our guest here on the program. Clay, you are an engineer. What type of engineering do you specialize in? So I specialize in water, wastewater, and stormwater. I also do some telecommunications work. So this is your uh, strength right here, what we're discussing, (laughs) I would say. Yeah, yeah, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yeah. So that leads me to this question. So let's assume that Clay Riley is involved in drawing up regulations. And because of your experience, let's say you're not an elected official, that you are in a government agency, be it in West Virginia or Washington, D.C. So you have drawn up regulations based on your work experience, your education, and the best applications of science that you can apply to your skills of engineering. Is it possible with this overturning of Chevron that, let's say that I'm a billionaire, I can come along, I don't like the way this regulation affects my profitability, and with the appropriate large campaign donation to the right people, I can get my way of thinking, which negates your science, as law. Is that a possibility? Not that it's not a possibility now, but at least with Chevron, you've got the opportunity for regulators based in science in some cases, sometimes not, uh, who can implement laws that are scientifically based at least. Is it possible with my large campaign donation I can override what you say is the right way to do? Well, what I, well, and I, and, and, and I kind of see where you're going with that. And I don't know that that's the case. I mean, I, I wouldn't, con- you know, I wouldn't concede that's the case at all. Um, what I look at it is, is that it puts more pressure, and I use that term because I think it does, um, on people who are crafting the legislation to say these are the types of things that are important to use science-based, science-based solutions for. I mean, and it's going to require that Congress – updates regulations. I think that's where you, you know, you will see more um, effort by industry and environmental groups to make sure that when the rulemaking, when the, you know, the the Clean Air Act was in what, 1990. So it's not been updated in 40 years. So they're going to have to look at it a little bit more often. And I think, you know, I heard in the last, um, I think the last segment, someone was talking about maybe some dysfunctionality in Congress. I think it's going to have to put – it does put more pressure back on them to make sure that they are getting crafted legislation that clearly defines scope and authority. I don't think it it leads itself to more, um, you know, illegal activity and and misconduct. I think that what it does is it makes us – uh, you know, from a state perspective, in a state legislative perspective, makes us be more clear about what our, what we're going to do. And I think we already had a little bit of that anyway with the rulemaking review authority. But I think it makes Congress be more specific about what their authority is going to be. 
Yeah, uh, Clay, you have more faith in Congress than I do <laughs> right right now. I think it's all aspirational of trying to do that. But looking at taking the political appointees of the agency out of the equation, looking at the uh, uh, the individuals that actually do the research, are we shifting the balance with the Chevron Act? Are we shifting the balance from the the scientific element of the agencies to Congress? Oh, it absolutely shifts balance, Bill. It shifts balance in two facets, in my opinion. I think it shifts um, balance from the agencies in the courts and the agencies in the Congress. But I think what when you look at sort of the framing of the, the, the you know our government, you know Congress should make the laws, and they can still delegate and they can still say this is what we want you to do. And this is the scope of authority of which to do that. What I think that it's in the court should interpret it and say, yeah, Congress has given them the authority. And I, I go back to the Clean Water Act because it's very clear that EPA can promulgate rules based specifically on science for the effluent requirements. I mean, that is not ambiguous at all, where it's the ambiguity and where they're, you know, like I said, the Clean Air Act was 1990, and they've shoehorned a lot of things in there. And I think that's why you saw Attorney General Attorney General Morrissey take them on in the Sackett case. So, I mean, I understand what you're saying. Does it shift the balance? Yeah. So the question is, is was the balance correct to start with? So Fair what? If, what about the opposition? Then, um, then Clay, who are saying that this is going to be just a jolt to the legal system. Um, you know, the, the opposition um, had some pretty strong words, which opposition generally does. Um, what are your feelings about that? Oh, I think that it will be a jolt to the um, judicial system. I think you will see, and I'm not an attorney, uh, but I think you will see increasing legal challenges uh, because of the Loper Bright in the Chevron deference uh, decision. I think when you look at, and, and again, 40 years of this is agencies have had um, preference in, in rulings, and whether they thought they were right or not right from a judicial standpoint, um, they've they've had a preference in, a, in an elevated um, status. So I think you'll see an increase in legal challenges to these things, and I think you'll have to see uh, improved crafting of legislation, even if it's aspirational, uh, within within Congress. I mean, it's just going to take it's going to take people to be, you know, more specific in what they are. And but it, I think it will be a jolt to some of the, the, the courts in the judicial system area. Yeah. And if, if we're done on that, I'd like to move on to something else, unless the two of you have a follow-up on what Clay just No, uh, Clay's given me a lot of food for thought, and I'll spend probably the next three days trying to digest <laughs> the points he's made, which are good points. Go right, go ahead. Right. Yeah, Clay, I wanted to bring up something that we've discussed on this program, but right now is Verboten in West Virginia. And you had, uh, during the recent uh, House of uh, uh, Delegates uh, um, 60 day session there, uh, HB 4266, which was create camera assisted enforcement of speeding in active work zones. And this is something that I am in West Virginia, you say speed camera, and that's the dividing line between people. Uh, I am in favor of speed cameras in work zones. I'm not in favor of them like they do in Washington, D.C., where every street is a speed trap waiting to, to grab you. But I'm in favor of them in work zones. I'm in favor of them in school zones, too. Tell me if that bill has any chance at any point in the future. You know, I, I would hope it does. And I'll, I'll give a little bit of context. You, as I mentioned that I'm an engineer, uh, or you mentioned I'm an engineer. I didn't mention it. Um, I, I have stood on interstates in work zones with cars speeding by at the speed limit, and it is fast, and it is dangerous. And when you have people exceeding, um, it, it, it is a real issue. If you look at the number of people who have been killed this year alone in work zones, it's more than you think. I forget the number off the top of my head, but there's been a significant number. I'm, I'm not in favor of the Washington, D.C.-esque uh, camera lights. I'm not in favor of the foreign country where they measure how fast you should be getting. It was very narrowly crafted to divided highways 
so it has to be a divided highway, and it is only in work zones, and it had a measure for warnings and that sort of thing. I don't know if it will get traction. I mean, I'm purely just trying to save the people who work in those um, work zones, save lives. Um, I hope that it will, but, uh, you know, it's that's always a work in progress. And, you know, I understand. I had some hesitation to it as well. But when you when you see people, when you know people who have been impacted, and I know people who have had people killed in work zones, and it really makes a difference in, in how you look at that. It It, it is a dividing line um, because I'm not a Big Brother-esque kind of person, but in a, in a work zone with a – you know, with people who are there, and it, it has to be an active work zone. The other part about that, Rob, I think it's really important, is they can't just mail you a ticket. There has to be a – you actually have to be pulled over in the work zone, zone by an on-duty patrol officer. So there were, there are other it's, – it's pretty complicated, but it's, um, you know, it's not just, hey, we're going to mail you a ticket kind of deal. Because that's the big complaint about people. Well, the cameras are inaccurate, and you know it wasn't my car, and whatever. But this this is an assisted bill. This is not, as you said, straight camera. This assists the patrolman who has the opportunity then to follow up with the ticket. But you're saying the Correct. patrolman has been there at the time. Yes, you, you it has to be operated in the time. Yes. Correct. Then why do we need a speed camera? Why do we need a camera? Well, it ha you have to have. Well, I, that's a legitimate question. Um, I think it's more when when I talked with you know a lot of the construction industry, I, the truth of the matter I'll, I'll just say it right here. I think the signs alone help slow people down. They do. Whether you even have a camera in the thing or not, the signs alone will help slow people down. And purely, the only goal is not to to to, to send tickets out. The only goal is to slow people down to to help save lives. Unless you're even, on Apple Harvest Drive, Delegate Riley, which you're not familiar <laughs> with, but there's one area where it says 25 miles per hour, and let me just say, nobody's working, but nobody's going 25 miles per hour either, so there you have it. Well, Apple Harvest Drive is not a divided highway, yeah. Maria. I don't think it is. <laughs> true, I've, true, true, true. We, we, we have an office over in Berkeley County, so I'm familiar with... Uh, he knows. It's Apple Harvest Drive. Okay. Delegate Riley, thanks so much for your time this morning. Hey, thanks, everyone. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks very much, Clay.